chapters thirty seven and thirty eight of the barnabys in america by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty seven the reunion of the happy family a seeming difference of opinion removed by the gentle voice of reason the party continue their progress westward to albany however major allen barnaby had no more intention of going than to jericho instead of committing any such folly he very deliberately went on shore at the spot from whence he could most conveniently reach the springs which his amiable family honoured with their presence and arriving there late in the evening spent the interval between that hour and morning in getting his party ready to set off nobody however who had seen him figuring away at the supper-table as a first-rate european man of fashion would have guessed the real state of the case nobody would have fancied that unless he had contrived to take himself off faster than the dear friends he had left could follow him he would in all human probability have been exposed to a very disagreeable explanation he was in high spirits charmingly affectionate in manner to the dear creatures he had rejoined and altogether so extremely agreeable that the party at the table d'hote very much regretted to find that his stay was to be so vexatiously short before the company retired to their respective apartments for the night major allen barnaby took his son-in-law aside and inviting him to a moonlight promenade in the front of the hotel made him by a few words comprehend the nature of the circumstances which rendered an immediate ramble westward desirable the don showed no want of quickness in his manner of receiving this intelligence and promised with a greater appearance of courage than was quite usual with him that he would take care his fatty should be ready this point settled the gentleman returned to the house and soon afterwards my heroine and her spouse were tete-a-tete -tete together it was the lady who spoke first what in the world does all this mean major said she looking a little as if she intended to be out of temper i should like to know if you please what reason you can possibly have for insisting upon paying everything to-night just as if we had not another hour to stay here you have several hours more to stay here my dear and i hope you will pass some of them in sleeping soundly but my reason for wishing to pay everything here honestly to-night is that i mean to go away very early to-morrow morning good heavens how tiresome you are exclaimed mrs allen barnaby with a flash of the eye that showed her to be very heartily provoked just as we have got acquainted with ever so many agreeable people and made ourselves perfectly comfortable you come down upon us with your tyrannical i must which just means i will and presto everything must be packed up in a moment and off we must go just as if patty and i and tornorino were so many blind puppies that you amused yourself by carrying about with you in a hamper blind my dearest love exclaimed the major you really wrong me very much nothing i can assure you can be further from my inclination than even leaving you in the dark for an hour and much less my barnaby would i have you blind listen to me for a very few minutes fair wife and i will shed light enough upon the business to make you see just as clearly as i do myself some more of your pretty gambling exploits i'll be bound for it exclaimed the lady with a very ominous frown not so my love he replied with great gentleness i really have not had the good fortune of being able to win as much money by gambling since you left me as would excite suspicion in a lynx but if you expect my beloved barnaby that i am to make ten thousand dollars in half an hour by any manoeuvre to which i should choose to invite all new york to be present while it is performed and that moreover i should stand to be cross-examined by them afterwards if you expect this my charming wife you overrate my abilities ten thousand dollars exclaimed my heroine with eyes and hands raised towards the ceiling ten thousand dollars what are you talking about i am talking my dear of the sum which i last inserted within the leather folds of my pocket-book replied the major demurely the which sum although in very dirty american bank-notes i would willingly submit to your ocular examination my dear were it not that i feel the moments to be rather precious and that i am aware you must have a good deal to do in order to be ready to start by the stage at five o'clock to-morrow morning you don't mean to say that you have really done some of those smoking fellows out of ten thousand dollars and then set off exactly in the way they would be sure to follow oh major major we shall be caught at last how could you be so mad as to come here chiefly my dear because i was quite sure that it was the very last place that they would calculate i should be likely to come to 
and secondly because i wish to have the honour and happiness of attending you and our charming daughter on the pleasant little circuitous tour which i intend making westward through this glorious and unequalled country i do believe you are mad major said his lady looking a good deal mystified and rather uncomfortable if i did not know by experience that drink what you will you never get really tipsy i should certainly think you were so now then you would be greatly mistaken mrs allen barnaby he replied i confess this little adventure has put me in good spirits and makes me appear perhaps rather more frolicsome than ordinary but you may trust me my dear my vivacity shall not bring you into any scrape whatever nor myself either so set about packing up there's a good woman and then we will contrive to get a little sleep if we can and patty exclaimed my heroine suddenly stopping in the midst of the obedient bustle into which she had thrown herself amongst her bag and boxes how on earth are we to get her out of bed by five o'clock in the morning to say nothing at all of getting her luggage ready shall i go to her major and try to frighten her into obedience go on with what you are about my dear replied her husband very composedly endeavouring as he spoke to assist in some of the needful packing operations i have taken care of that tornorino knows all about it and he has engaged for their both being ready and their trunks too but major again exclaimed his wife and again suspending her activity while she asked the question how is it possible you can be so perfectly at ease as you seem to be when you have come off with such a sum as that what in the world should prevent their setting off after you hush what noise is that mercy on me what a scene it would make if they were actually to follow you in here like a felon and a thief and carry you to jail before my eyes don't torment yourself by any such fancies my dear he replied take care how you put in that beautiful velvet that's the dress that you look the best in and of course i have a particular value for it but major persisted his wife after giving to the precious robe all the care it demanded what would become of us if these people should follow you here and actually get you put in prison seeing at length that these anxious doubts and fears did very seriously impede the packing process the major condescended to calm his lady's tender anxieties by saying be contented wife when i tell you that there is no law in the land that can trouble me for the next two months and i must truly be in every way unworthy the happiness of possessing you for my wife were i fool enough not to get out of their way by that time the major was out of luck this last speech seemed likely to put a stop to the packing altogether if you really have two months clear before you major said his wife why should we be kept out of our natural rest in this way i'll be hanged if i don't get to bed at this moment if that is the case two months why leave the country at which end you will it won't take two months to get on board the major now began to look as if he would not like all this much longer mrs allen barnaby said he you may remain up or go to bed whichever you happen to like best and moreover you may pack or not pack as it may happen to please you moreover such is my respect for your will that if you do not like to accompany me on my projected travels you have my unconditional consent to stay where you are but i leave this place at five o'clock to-morrow morning the lady on hearing these words renewed her labours and as she did so without any further remonstrance the amiable major at last took pity upon her curiosity and explained pretty tolerably at full length the whole transaction that has been related above it was to say the least of it very injudicious to attempt keeping so right-thinking a woman as mrs allen barnaby in the dark even for an hour for the instant the matter was properly laid before her she at once displayed all the admirable powers of her able mind and looked upon the whole transaction with a calmly philosophic eye of wisdom i thank you major she said i thank you sincerely for having at length made me understand the nature of this transaction as a jest played off to avenge as it were the numberless tricks which we hear of as practice against our countrymen it is more than justifiable and in that light my dearest major it commands my warmest and most patriotic admiration as a trial of skill too it is admirable truly admirable you know my principles my dearest husband and how very highly in the rank of virtues i class every effort that is made by human beings from motives of family affection and a wish to benefit those whom nature has made dependent upon us 
this consideration as you will easily believe prevents my judging too harshly of the little artifice which so cleverly doubled the sum of which it was the purpose of those stupid men to defraud you it was masterly donny but i will not delay a moment longer never oh never may i be an impediment to the exertions of a man who so nobly so bravely perils himself for the good of his family having pronounced these words with every demonstration of deep feeling mrs allen barnaby addressed herself once more to her packing yet once more she quitted it it was but for a moment but running to where the major stood in the act of closing a well-crammed portmanteau she threw her arms round his neck and tenderly kissed him exclaiming as she returned to her employment excuse me dearest donny but my heart was full to overflowing you are a noble creature and not to love you is impossible at the hour appointed on the following morning the major and his lady the don and his together with all their travelling appendages were safely stowed in a stage that was journeying westward and there for the present we must leave them chapter thirty eight filial affection beautifully displayed an eavesdropper a new acquaintance cross examinations nothing could exceed the pleasant hilarity of major allen barnaby's spirits when he found himself once more on board a steamboat careening westward on the bosom of lake erie at the rate of twelve knots an hour his pocket-book crammed with bank-notes and nobody whom he had left behind him having any more right or reason to guess whither he was bound than he had to guess which way the wind would be likely to blow on the morrow and how should they since he did not know himself his lady who had been informed with the most perfect conjugal confidence of the real state of his finances was under the influence of the same delightful harmony of spirits as himself and though the don and patty were by no means admitted to the inmost recesses of the precious source from whence all this felicity sprung they both of them had sufficient acuteness to feel quite sure that all was going right in the money department and that such being the case they would be likely sooner or later to come in for their share of the joke also they may be as secret as they will tornarino said patty as she watched her father and mother laughing vehemently on the further side of the deck but if i don't get some of the cream of the jest and that's the money never trust me more and i'll tell you what my don she continued creeping very close to him never let you or i say another word to either of them about our acting as to papa he is a doting old fool and has worked himself into a desperate fright for fear i should leave him that's the english of his objections but as for mamma i can see as far into a millstone as she can maybe and all the fuss she makes about it is just from jealousy and nothing else i do think she is the vainest old soul that ever walked the earth and the notion of my going to be stared at and admired where she can never hope for leave to show her old face is altogether more than she can bear and so there now the murder's out as far as she is concerned mais c'est bête mais bête exclaimed tornorino for the old lady to hope herself belle comme sa fille that's all right and true returned his clever wife who besides having made great progress in various other branches of human learning was beginning to understand very tolerably her husband's composite language but we must manage my dear to do something more than just to find out that the old lady is a goose we must find out also how to feather her gay gosling's nest and this must be the scheme darling whenever papa is in the sort of humour we see him now we must coax and coax till we get something out of him and by degrees if we save it all up we may be able to hoard enough for a frolic as the folks here would call it and then be off my darling see if we won't and they may just wait till we want a little more before they get another chance of seeing our two handsome faces again whether the accomplished tornorino exactly agreed with his lovely lady in this view of what would be wisest for the future it is impossible to say because he cautiously avoided expressing any opinion on the subject and confined his answer to a fond caress which was at least as far removed from expressing contradiction as acquiescence but the pretty patty was perfectly satisfied and insisted not on any further explanation but presently proposed that they should join their gay parents in order to begin the coaxing process with as little delay as possible how i do love to see you laugh my own dear papa said patty passing her arm within that of her father as he leaned over the side of the ship may i ask what it is about you know papa that i love to laugh too it was just about nothing at all patty or at any rate the joke was one that you would not understand for it had something to do with business and i am sure you know nothing about that do you darling said her loving father 
why i know this much papa replied the fond daughter looking lovingly up in his face i know that when people look so monstrously pleased when they are talking about business it is a sure sign that they have been making money by it what do you say to that pap don't you think i am right you are so far right patty that nobody i suspect would be very likely to be found laughing when they were discussing business by which they had lost money replied the major demurely true as true darling pap rejoined his daughter looking very intelligent but my wit goes a little further than that for i suspect that when people laugh so very heartily they must have done something more clever than merely not losing well mrs don replied the major pinching her cheek you may suspect what you like you look too handsome to be quarrelled with do i she cried clapping her hands joyfully then know that you can't for your life refuse to give one little tiny twenty dollars to buy me a new cloak and bonnet can you pap can you refuse your own poor patty who has not a single cent in the wide world that she can call her own think of that pap is it not shocking and i your only child too i doubt very much your wanting either bonnet or cloak patty said her father shaking his head at her however i have no objection now and then as you pretty well know to make a fool of myself in order to please you major allen barnaby extracted his well-filled pocket-book from its deep receptacle in the breast of his coat as he spoke and drawing forth four notes of five dollars each presented them to his daughter who received them with a joyous jump and paid for them with a very hearty kiss as no individual excepting mrs allen barnaby and don tornorino was near the spot on which this transfer took place it never occurred to the parties concerned in it that any individual was privy to it save and except themselves and those immediately belonging to them but in this they were mistaken quietly seated on a coil of rope which was concealed from the eyes of the barnaby race by a huge pile of portmanteaus and carpet-bags was an old long-legged yankee lawyer who might have been supposed even if they had been aware of his vicinity to have been too much occupied by the newspaper which he seemed to be reading to have any eyes left for looking about him such a conjecture however would have been altogether erroneous mr gabriel monkton was never so much occupied by anything when surrounded by his fellow-creatures as to be unable to look about him it was by looking about him that he had made his way upwards from a very dirty little boy sweeping an office to a very good-looking gentleman seated at the highest desk in it and he was too sensible a man to leave off a profitable habit merely because it had been of use to him therefore though he was now a very rich instead of a very poor man he still continued to find out everything that happened within his reach and in one way or another was pretty sure to find it answer it needed no ghost to tell him that major allen barnaby with his full lips and his full chest was no american he found that out before he had turned his quid once after first glancing at him and having made this discovery he watched him of course the more narrowly for there is a great deal more interest and very often more profit too in finding out the who the why and the wherefore concerning a foreigner than concerning a native and then his daughter with his wife was rather of a chuckling and triumphant kind the tone of which grated a little on the sober ear of the new englander and suggested notions of successful trickery or at the very least of successful barter now as both these branches of human industry are held by all genuine yankees to belong to them almost as a monopoly established by nature herself it cannot be wondered at if mr gabriel monkton looked at major allen barnaby with a jealous if not a suspicious eye and then came in full view of the ensconced chewer the blooming patty with her jumping and jollity her kissing and coaxing and then the plump pocket-book and a very advantageous side view of the contents of one pocket thereof the mind of mr gabriel monkton was both analytical and logical and he never suffered these noble faculties to lie idle on an occasion like the present he perceived that the notes thus made visible to him were the dear darling dirty dollar notes as precious to his heart as they were familiar to his eyes and which spoke their birthplace and their origin in a language not to be mistaken ergo this store of wealth was not the travelling cash of an english niagara visitor but must have been found if not made within the limits of the glorious union as to its being the product of english bills bank-notes or sovereigns changed for convenience into american currency that was quite out of the question as no man in his senses as the yankee meditator well knew would change english money for american if he could help it and therefore the plethoric form of the pocket-book put the matter out of all doubt 
how then did the fellow get together such an unaccountable lot of state's paper not state papers this change in the position of a letter would have rendered the question one of utter indifference to the questioner it was a puzzle that no unaided guessing or calculating could solve and therefore delightful as were the sensations enjoyed in his present retreat his heels being thrown considerably higher than his head his mouth full of tobacco and the uninterrupted spittoon round him as extensive as his heart could wish notwithstanding all this mr gabriel monkton manfully resolved to sacrifice the enjoyment of it for the purpose of acquiring the information his intelligent mind thirsted to obtain with this view he continued to watch the movements of the party till the junior couple had left the senior one and then letting drop first one leg and then the other and placing his light-coloured beaver on his head in such an angle as gave it the chance of keeping its place during the act of rising he gave a sort of frog-like spring and found himself once again in the much less luxurious but much more ordinary position of a human being in plain english he stood upright the sound produced by this violent change of attitude caused major and mrs allen barnaby to start and turn their heads towards him this was lucky for it served all the purposes of an introduction no offence i hope sir said mr gabriel monkton with a conciliatory sort of nod but i expect that i startled your lady a bit not at all i assure you replied mrs allen barnaby with one of those swimming swinging curtsies with which she never failed to honour every new acquaintance i am not quite so nervous as that fine day for a steam sir said the lawyer having acknowledged mrs allen barnaby's civility by a bow for mr gabriel monkton like the majority of his countrymen as long at least as they remain on their native soil never addressed his conversation to a lady while there was one of the nobler sex near and a capital boat this as i expect you'll allow delightful sir both both delightful the weather and the boat too are worthy of america returned the major with a smile of great amenity i expect you mean the united states sir when you say america for we can't calculate that this whole quarter of the world can show such craft as this to say nothing of the weather unquestionably sir i spoke incorrectly returned the courteous major but the fact is that the immense disproportion in point of importance which the nation properly denominated the united states of america bears to the entire continent leads europeans to forget that the quarter of the world called america contains anything else likely enough sir and in time i should not be very greatly surprised if all the civilized portion of the world was to adopt and take upon itself the appellation of united states owing one and all maybe the federal authority of our president there are considerable many indications up and down the world in many directions that makes it look probable we think said mr gabriel monkton i give you my honour sir returned the major that the same idea has repeatedly struck me and for my own part i positively think it would be the salvation of mankind indeed without some measure of that sort i profess i don't see how the existence of the european nations is to be preserved why on this side the water we are all pretty well come to the same notion that's a fact but you see sir before anything of that kind could be acted upon we should have a good deal to do in the way of condescending to make sacrifices for the general good returned mr gabriel monkton there is no denying sir he continued with the modest air of a man acknowledging a weakness there is no denying that it is pleasant and agreeable ay very pleasant and agreeable to be first and foremost of all the people of the earth but if once we take it into our heads to make it a main object with our government that they shall gather all the nations of the world and sit and brood over them as i may say hatching them out of their present egg-like sort of imprisonment till they all fly off like so many freeborns if once we do this where will our superiority be all the world will look then to share and share alike i calculate how admirably true exclaimed mrs allen barnaby clasping her hands and turning her great eyes towards the sky is it not a pleasure major to listen to such magnificent ideas i beg your excuse sir i did not know your title till your lady named it said mr gabriel monkton in the english army i presume sir yes sir that is my profession i am a major in the army and hold also an appointment on the staff which i am sorry to say will not permit my being long absent from home it is a sad punishment for an enlightened englishman after once finding himself in the united states to feel that he shall be obliged to leave them again said the major with a sigh i expect it must sir 
returned his new acquaintance then you don't calculate he added after pausing for a moment upon continuing here for the purpose of making any speculation in the mercantile line no sir i have no idea of the kind my duty unfortunately calls me elsewhere then you are only here to take a stare at us i guess like the rest of the world nobody i expect counts themselves right down well educated in these days without having come a few thousand miles to look at the citizens of the united states observed mr gabriel monkton the natural harshness of his adust countenance a good deal softened it is pretty considerable much of a compliment that i don't see the way to deny it that's a fact and pray major may i ask the favour of your name major allen barnaby had meditated more than once since leaving new york upon the probable advantages and disadvantages of once more making some little alteration in his name but not having fully decided upon the measure he was now in a manner compelled to decide against it for he instantly remembered the numerous packages which bore labels which it would not do to contradict and he therefore answered though perhaps with some little shadow of hesitation my name sir is allen barnaby permit me to present to you mrs allen barnaby the yankee bowed stiffly so stiffly indeed that my heroine who had rarely in the course of her eventful life found it so difficult to draw attention to herself soon became weary of finding herself entière where she was not looked upon as a principal and walked off to a sofa near the stern of the vessel where two smart-looking ladies were already seated whom she flattered herself she should find means of rendering more sociable than the stiff mr gabriel monkton End of chapters thirty seven and thirty eight Chapter thirty nine of the Barnabys in America by Francis Milton Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty nine. Cross examinations continued. Touching reminiscences. Local associations. Mrs. Allen Barnaby displays her talent of acute observation upon the fair natives. She steps between her husband and danger mrs allen barnaby was not better pleased at leaving the grim-looking mr gabriel monkton than he was at losing her company he was not particularly fond of ladies society at any time and just now he thought the wife of his new acquaintance particularly in the way no sooner was she fairly gone than he changed his tone and manner entirely and entered at once upon the national cross-examination to which all strangers are subjected if intended to be noticed at all and which way i wonder may you be travelling sir in order to see the most and the best of us my object at present sir is to see something of your magnificent lakes the lakes yes sir the lakes are magnificent unaccountable there's no doubt of it and where might you happen to start from last why we have been a good while merely travelling about from place to place in order to see everything without allowing ourselves time enough to stay very long anywhere said the major but where did you start from sir this trip persisted the yankee why positively i forget the name of the place i have a dreadful head for names replied the englishman indeed well then what was the name of the last place you stopped at that you do remember oh baltimore was the last place at which we made any considerable halt and west point added the major apparently much delighted by the sudden recollection yes i remember now we passed a fortnight at a place called west point most delightfully indeed returned mr gabriel monkton with rather a comical accent then i expect that though you are from the old country you have got some relations or connections in the new one no indeed we have no such advantage replied the major i am sure i wish we had it would be delightful but why sir should you suppose this likely well now in point of fact i can't realize the notion of any one who has not got relations either among the lads or the professors i can't realize i say any one bidding at west point a whole fortnight because everything curious there can be seen in two or three hours observed mr gabriel monkton that is perfectly true certainly returned major allen barnaby with a good-humoured smile but yet somehow or other the place had an indescribable charm for us perhaps it might arise from its striking resemblance to a favourite scene with which we are familiar at home in the way of a military college do you mean sir or just in point of location demanded the persevering inquirer both my dear sir both replied the major readily i have two nephews whom i perfectly adore at our military establishment at sandhurst 
and this circumstance together with the extraordinary similarity of the scenery produced a most remarkable effect upon us all my dear wife who is in all respects most completely a second self to me was inconceivably touched by the coincidence and this it was which induced us to remain there so long and what's the name of the great river major allen barnaby what answers to our hudson at our college it must be pretty considerably larger i expect than they have set any of your rivers and streams down in the maps at least i can't say that i have ever realized any river in england to be equal to our hudson what may be the name sir of that one that runs below your military establishment it is the thames sir replied the major boldly which though not perhaps quite so large just at sandhurst as the hudson is at west point is nevertheless a very noble stream as i suppose you know why as to that sir everything goes by comparison returned mr gabriel monkton and may i be so bold as to ask whether you found the discipline at west point as much resembling your sandhurst as the location does i should say sir returned the judicious major that the arrangements of all kinds at west point were incomparably superior to ours and though my nephews are devilish fine-looking lads it is impossible not to allow that the american young gentlemen make altogether a much finer appearance they carry themselves so admirably likely enough sir was the complacent reply we mostly reckon that upon a fair comparison and an honest judgment the citizens of the united states are the finest race that providence has as yet created upon the earth and now sir may i take the freedom to ask which way you are going why upon my word sir i am hardly able to answer you replied the major with another of his frank and pleasant smiles the fact is you see sir that we are travelling so wholly and solely for pleasure that we took a resolution at the very beginning to fix upon nothing but to just go here there and everywhere as whim and fancy might dictate you may depend upon it sir this is the way to enjoy travelling well i don't know it may perhaps to you gentry of the old country who ain't i expect particular famous for knowing your own minds but we american citizens prefer for the most part i calculate knowing when we set out to what place we are going returned mr gabriel monkton with a queer little smile then may i ask sir to which point of this most beautiful lake you may be bound demanded the major gaily as that perhaps may assist me in coming to a decision i should be delighted i assure you in retaining the pleasure of your society as long as possible the boat stops to wood and put down and maybe take up passengers at cleveland and it's a place that in course like all our towns has its beauties and recommendations but nevertheless it is not desirable to stop at for long in comparison of sandusky was the answer then it is to sandusky sir i presume that you purpose going yourself said the major yes sir to sandusky replied the other major allen barnaby then politely touched his hat and walked off having marked the direction which his lady had taken when she walked off before him the major with very proper conjugal feelings took the same which soon brought him in sight of the sofa where mrs allen barnaby had taken refuge and on which she still sat together with the two ladies whom she had found there the excellent husband's amiable feelings in seeking her were immediately rewarded by seeing her rise from her place the moment she perceived him and come forward to take his arm well i have been questioned enough i hope for one bout said mrs allen barnaby as soon as they had moved out of hearing in my life i never met with such curious people as those two women then i hope you have been as cautious as they were curious my dear said the major looking a little anxious i have been undergoing a sharp questioning also and my answers were calculated to give as little information as possible i hope and trust that yours were given in the same spirit for it would be rather suspicious if we were caught telling different stories then all we have got to hope major is that your curious man and my curious women do not belong to the same party for as sure as the sun's in heaven i have answered pretty nearly the truth to every question they have asked except you know just for setting oneself off a little which of course everybody does when they are talking about themselves to strangers one must blaze away a little then or never but excepting trying to make them think that i was a distant relation to blood royal or something of that sort i give you my honour i have not told them a single lie then i give you my honour mrs allen barnaby that you are considerably more of a fool than i gave you credit for after all i told you at saratoga i do think you might have found some better theme to descant upon than the explaining at full length where we came from and all the rest of it replied her husband frowning 
i never said a single syllable about you my dear replied mrs allen barnaby i only talked a little of our delightful season at the springs and i'm sure you had nothing to do with that not even the paying for it besides it's nonsense making a fuss donny what's done is done if you had any particular lies of your own that you wished me to tell you should have said so you know perfectly well my dear that i consider it quite a matter of duty in all that sort of thing to do exactly what you desire however i flatter myself there is no harm done for the chances are fifty to one that your man and my woman don't belong to each other don't they retorted major allen barnaby in a tone much less amiable than usual just look to the right if you please mrs allen barnaby did look to the right and thereupon certainly saw reason to doubt the accuracy of the opinion she had thus expressed her fifty to one would have been a losing bet for there stood mr gabriel monkton in the very closest converse with the two ladies she had just quitted evidently listening to some information they were bestowing upon him with great attention and what made this circumstance the more alarming was that the very instant she turned her head towards them they exchanged sinister glances and ceased to speak the major was evidently much annoyed but his usual excellent judgment prevented his indulging himself in reproaches to his admirable helpmate on the contrary he said to her with the same flattering air of confidence as usual we have certainly got into a scrape my barnaby with these confounded people and all we can do now is to get quit of them as soon as possible it will be best to not for us to seem confabulating and consulting together so you go your way and i'll go mine but remember we must both of us carry with us eyes and ears which may be more profitably used than our tongues so saying he walked away leaving his penitent wife determined to atone for her indiscretion by keeping so sharp a look-out as might enable them to guess if any disagreeable consequences were likely to arise from her having given one account of their party and her dearly beloved husband another these good resolutions were soon rewarded with the success they deserved for upon her retiring to the ladies cabin and turning into one of the little beds which occasional rough weather upon this inland sea rendered necessary she speedily found herself in the most favourable position possible for ascertaining how much mischief she had done on this occasion it may be observed that the weather was peculiarly fine and on the bosom of lake erie as calm and as unruffled as the gentle canal in st james park it was not therefore from any feeling of indisposition that my heroine thus withdrew herself drawing the muslin curtains between herself and the rest of the world so as to prevent any chance of her being seen on the contrary she never was in better health or with spirits more on the alert to catch everything which might come within reach of her ambushed ear ere she had remained ten minutes in the retreat thus cleverly chosen two young ladies entered the cabin together one of whom she immediately discovered to be the youngest of the two curious fair ones she had encountered on the deck oh my this is jam arethusa exclaimed this pretty daughter of an ugly father for she was in truth no less a personage than the sole heiress of mr gabriel monkton we shall have some capital fun this frolic pa and ma between em have come right down upon a set of englishers who are sailing under false colours there never was such a man as pa i expect for catching out folks of this sort well i'm sure that if i was at the top of the tree he should just have a statue for it replied the animated arethusa adding with still greater energy all the english are to my fancy first-rate disgusting but what is that your pa has found out this time oh my it is just a proper yankee bit of cleverness i promise you but i can't just go it all over now cause i must go up again as soon as i have fixed my curls to help ma find out some more if she can but i can tell you this much that pa means to watch this major as he calls himself pretty close and swears he shan't go on shore without having him at his heels and what's to come next i can't say but pa will take care of that and ma says that she calculates upon our having the fun of seeing him marched off to prison come along arethusa what a slow girl you are i have done fixed my hair spit curls and all before you have done twiddling with your collar the fair friends then departed leaving mrs allen barnaby to meditate on what she had heard she did meditate and to some purpose too for before she again squeezed her ample person through the all too narrow entrance to the bed on which she reposed herself she had fully arranged the mode and the means by which she should extricate her husband from the inconvenience likely to arise from her having stated that they came from one place while he had positively declared they came from another 
she knew better however than to make her way up to the deck by the stairs leading from the lady's cabin which might perchance betray rather too plainly to the young beauties who had just taken that direction how indiscreetly they had chosen the place of their late conference passing through the gentleman's cabin therefore and reaching the deck at its extremity she was presently leaning over the gallery rail at a point almost as far removed as possible from the retreat where she had so cleverly lain in ambush and here having for some time espied her the cautious major at length ventured to join her well said he taking his place close at her side and placing himself in an attitude that seemed to manifest great interest in the breaking of the wavelets against the planks of the vessel well have you made any discoveries my dear discoveries she repeated i believe i have made discoveries but never mind donny don't agitate yourself i'll get you out of this scrape as cleverly as i did from that of big gang bank she then hastily but very intelligibly recited what she had heard but upon his uttering a few expletives indicative of some slight irritation of temper at the disagreeable turn the adventure seemed likely to take she stopped him somewhat authoritatively saying with an uplifted finger and a flashing eye not another word major allen barnaby in a way of reproach or complaining or i leave you to your fate difficulties seem but to excite and expand my genius and i feel the same happy confidence in my own powers which i have ever done through every stage of my remarkable existence but in order to enable me to put this to profit you must give my powers full scope major if you will let me have my own way and do exactly what i bid you i'll have you on shore at cleveland without letting that odious scarecrow of a man know one bit about it any more than that tall chimney there set about it then returned her husband with more sharpness of tone than was usual with him for he was in truth too thoroughly vexed at the result of her tattling communications to be at all disposed to encourage the vapouring style she had assumed for one moment she looked at him earnestly and seemed doubting whether she should resent his want of politeness and abandon him to his fate or generously forgive his petulance and again extend her helping hand to save him the very wise second thought which suggested the impossibility of punishing the contumacious major alone at once decided the question and with a smile half playful half reproachful she said come on donny no sour looks if you please only be grateful and acknowledge as you have sometimes done before that i am your good angel and i will take care that you are a free man still forgive me my barnaby said the again smiling major if i permitted myself to doubt for a moment that my cause was a safe one if you undertook its defence but what in the world is it that you propose to do my dear love i protest to you that i think this business is a very awkward one not a bit of it replied his wife cheerily pray my dear do you think you have sufficient strength of mind to endure with tolerable composure the seeing me exceedingly ill again that expressive word again reassures me my charming barnaby for it at once turns the threatened illness into an admirable jest but do you really think my dear that you could put off this trick again so as to get me free from this devilish steamboat without being followed by this grim gabriel the old trick donny with the assistance of a new one following it she replied will i think suffice to do all we want but i don't believe it is quite a new trick either for i remember hearing something very like it before but it is not the worse for that you know if it serves our turn and now listen and you shall know what i mean to do and what i mean you to do you will see me presently walking down the lady's stairs into the little cabin when i get there i will wash my face you know donny just as i did before and when this is done i will crawl up again looking very poorly indeed and then you must help me to the sofa and then i must lie down and then you must go and bring patty to me and then i must send her to borrow one of the lady's smelling bottles and then i suppose they will come to me when i shall take care to make them understand that heavenly beautiful as their great big lake may be the movement of the boat on it makes me very ill in short i shall make everybody understand that i am determined to land at the first stopping-place which i understand is called cleveland mrs allen barnaby paused for an instant to take breath upon which the major ventured to hint that he greatly doubted if the mere circumstance of their landing at cleveland instead of sandusky would suffice to distance mr gabriel monkton if indeed he were as determined to track him as the language he had overheard seemed to indicate a whole volume of scorn flashed from the eyes of my heroine as she listened to these words you doubt it major do you and to tell you the truth my dear i doubt it too 
depend upon it if i thought he could be so easily put off i should give myself no further trouble about the matter you must hear a little more first if you please before you venture to decide whether my scheme will answer or not after having clearly given these ladies to understand that i mean to land at cleveland i shall declare myself unable to sit up any longer and you and patty must help me downstairs and lay me upon the bed well then imagine us all down there as snug as possible of course you know as well as i do that whenever anything happens which takes any of the ladies husbands into the ladies cabin all the other females as they call themselves keep clear of it as if they thought that he was a shark going to swallow them all up we shall therefore have the cabin entirely to ourselves and then i will dress you in my large long cloak petticoats and all that and you shall put on my large leghorn sunbonnet and white lace veil and patty shall help you up to the deck exactly when the boat stops which they say is just when it is getting dark the passage and all that you know is paid already tornorino shall go with you and if any questions are asked about the major patty shall say that you are going on to sandusky because you expect some one to meet you there on business and that we shall travel by land under the escort of the don to join you there what do you say to this major but what on earth is to become of you my dear if you remain here on board by yourself demanded the major affectionately don't trouble yourself about me my dear she replied gaily there's a number of shabby-looking women on board and i mean as soon as it gets dusk to go up amongst them dressed quite differently from what i am now there's that old tartan cloak you know will cover me up completely and i have no doubt in the world that i shall get out of the boat with the rest of the riff-raff without any single soul taking notice of me you know their way of always making everybody pay at the half-way station and that prevents anybody's being looked after when they step on shore you are perfectly right my dear barnaby as to that and i do declare that considering the hour for landing and all the other circumstances i see no reason in the world why the plot should not succeed besides it is your invention you know and that gives me confidence for everything you do succeeds why i must confess she replied that i have rarely taken it into my head to plot and plan without succeeding however though i take credit to myself for the invention or at any rate for the adopting it you must please to remember donny that a good deal of its success must depend upon yourself i am quite sure that this fellow expects somehow or other to make a good thing of catching you there are a good many queer tricks you know practised in this country of one sort or another and i take it these yankees are up to a thing or two as well as your friends at new orleans perhaps he suspects that you have not been visiting their glorious and immortal institutions for nothing and may hope that if he keeps you in sight for a day or two something may turn up about you my dear which might make somebody or other very grateful to him for having looked after you a little and that's precisely what will happen mrs allen barnaby as sure as your graceful and ever charming form hangs over this rail so far you understand the circumstances of the case to perfection but i do not exactly perceive how any exercise of my own peculiar talents upon this occasion can in any way assist in enabling us to avoid the catastrophe we anticipate your own peculiar talent donny may have been more necessary to get you into the scrape than out of it nevertheless my dear i have sufficient confidence in your general cleverness and ability to feel assured of your passing with more than credit with honour through that part of the business which must inevitably fall to your share said mrs allen barnaby and pray what part of the business may that be my dear demanded the major if it means the walking under your garments with equal grace to yourself i must fail the thing is impossible tranquillize your spirits my love on that point returned the lady with a playfully tender smile nothing of the sort will be necessary in about two hours it will be quite dark enough for you to walk as you will under my garments without any eye being likely to perceive the difference your part of the acting must take place immediately after you have left me upon the sofa with patting listening to my groans you must assume a very unfond and unfeeling air foreign to your heart my love of course but absolutely necessary to your circumstances and having sought and found your agreeable new acquaintance mr gabriel monkton you must tell him that i am horribly sick and then you must swagger a little about the horrid bore of travelling with women and then you must swear that you would not miss seeing the person you are to meet at sandusky for all the sick women in the world but add with some little show of softer feeling that for all that 
you are not such a brute either as to insist upon my going on and then you may speak of the excellent qualities of tornarino and the perfect satisfaction with which you can trust me to his care and to that of my daughter it is in this scene my dear major that you must display the talent for which i give you credit when you have performed this you must conclude by telling him that you must intrude into the ladies cabin in order to apprise the ladies of your party that they must land at cleveland without you and then you may walk off to find us taking care ostentatiously to proclaim as you go your regret at the necessity which obliges you to take the liberty of entering that apartment and taking care also that gabriel does not lose sight of you a moment sooner than it is absolutely necessary five minutes retreat with patty and me will suffice for your toilette you must make our good tornarino understand his part in our little domestic drama and school him to knock at the door of the cabin as soon as the boat reaches cleveland he must give you his arm through the gentleman's cabin the stairs from which open upon the deck close to the gangway by which they go ashore i shall follow at some distance after with a bundle and basket like one of the market women and of course you are none of you to take any notice of me but depend upon it i will take very good care of myself tornorino must set about collecting all our luggage for landing at cleveland and place it near the gangway and now mr major what do you say to it do you feel competent to undertake your part i think i may venture to say that i do he replied so now let us begin move the first as you're descending to the cabin in order to remove that slight and unnecessary addition to your charms which fashion my dear love has induced you to adopt go then and rely upon it that i shall neither mistake the order of the subsequent scenes nor forget my cue perfectly satisfied with the spirit of active obedience which she read in her clever husband's eye she gave him an approving nod and moved off End of chapter thirty nine chapters forty and forty one of the barnabys in america by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter forty a skilful manoeuvre skilfully executed a pleasant supper party it was impossible for major allen barnaby to watch the painful languor of movement with which his charming wife withdrew from his side without admiration long as he had been her husband he really did admire her exceedingly nor was the feeling of that light and idle kind which leads to nothing he felt all her claim upon his ready co-operation in the scheme she had sketched out and instantly began his share of the work by seeking tornarino and explaining to him both the business he had to perform and the reason for it this was not a sort of business on which the graceful don was at all likely to be dull of comprehension and the major left him on seeing his pale and trembling barnaby emerge again from the ladies cabin quite satisfied with the ready acquiescence he expressed in the next moment the attentive husband was by his pallid lady's side and having according to order laid her gently upon the sofa he bustled off to seek his daughter and now it was that the greatest difficulty arose patty upon being assured that her mother was seasick or lake-sick and desired her assistance burst forth in her usual style of free remonstrance upon the absurdity of supposing that she could do her any good lor papa she exclaimed how you do spoil her i don't believe she's any more sick than i am why she ate like a wolf at breakfast i do wish you would let me alone papa i want to stay here till tornorino comes back he said he was only going for a minute and he'll think i am tumbled overboard if he does not find me here it has been hinted before that the major from some little feeling of paternal weakness did not wish that his daughter should be made fully acquainted with all the manoeuvrings to which he occasionally found himself compelled to have recourse when his affectionate regard for the welfare of his family induced him to practise any trifling irregularity in his monetary transactions it was this feeling which now embarrassed him patty as everybody knows was a very quick intelligent young woman and a very few words would have sufficed to make her comprehend the whole business but major allen barnaby did not like to speak these few words he knew however that the co-operation of his daughter in the rather hazardous scheme now afoot was absolutely necessary and therefore after looking at her with an air of perplexity for half a minute he said come come patty you must not only be a good girl but a very particularly good girl just now or we shall get into a worse scrape than you think for after you all left new york 
i got among a set of worthless chaps which it is very difficult to help doing sometimes in a strange country and we got quarrelling and as ill luck would have it one of the fellows insisted upon it that i should fight a duel with him which i am sorry to say ended fatally i am sure i did not know it at the time but i have been told since that the united states government never forgives a man who kills another in a duel and i am therefore now in the greatest possible danger of being taken up and executed lor papa how horrid exclaimed patty looking a little terrified but what has all this to do with ma's being sick a great deal my dear as you will find if you will but have patience to listen to me he replied i have discovered within this hour patty that i am suspected by a man on board and my only chance of saving myself is by getting on shore disguised as a woman oh goodness what fun exclaimed madame tornorino clapping her hands with an air of great hilarity but lor pa they'll be sure to find you out i hope not my dear said the major gravely but this will depend entirely on the manner in which my family assist me he then explained to her the mode in which he intended to proceed endeavouring to impress upon her mind the absolute necessity of silence and caution amongst them all and the conversation ended at last by her saying in a whisper but very earnestly well pap it shan't be my fault if you are hanged you may depend upon that perfectly contented by this affectionate assurance the major then dismissed her and the subsequent scenes of the drama followed exactly in the order which mrs allen barnaby had laid down and without any blundering whatever on the part of the dramatis personae till the critical moment arrived when the major with one arm resting on that of tornorino and the other raised in order to hold a pocket-handkerchief to his mouth stepped forth with a languid air from the ladies cabin and began his hazardous progress through the long saloon appropriated to the gentlemen nothing could possibly be better than the arrangement of his drapery the large shawl thrown over his shoulders completely disguised the outline of his person and perhaps no man of his age measuring five feet ten and a half ever contrived to contract his limbs more skilfully than did major allen barnaby as he slowly moved onwards it was probably the perfect success with which he enacted his wife's attitude as he dropped his head a little on one side while his feathers and flowing veil drooped also that overset the gravity of patty which till that moment she had sustained admirably but then for one short moment she forgot herself and exclaiming aloud oh my goodness how funny she clapped her hands in her usual joyous style and laughed outright the admirable presence of mind of the dawn however prevented any fatal effects from this thoughtless sally there is nothing to laugh my love in the sickness he said shaking his head very gravely while the really suffering major uttered so sad and womanly a sigh that if anybody had thought about them at all it could only have been to deprecate the hard-hearted levity of the young woman who could find amusement in her feeble mother's sufferings fortunately however the two or three persons who were scattered through the long room were too much occupied by their own concerns to pay any attention to the group and they made their way to the top of the stairs just as the first rush of the persons intending to land at cleveland was elbowing and shouldering its way across the plank either from the fear that a too close juxtaposition with those who were jostling one another as they crossed might betray him or else from the wish to be perfectly consistent in the representation of his assumed character the major held back for a moment till a dozen or so of the most eager had passed the plank then still preserving with admirable steadiness of demeanour the timid face of a suffering woman he too crossed it tornorino very carefully stepping backwards as he preceded him and the penitent patty following looking as grave as a judge in this manner they very safely reached the bank but just as the delighted major felt his feet firmly planted on the sod and while he was thinking that he might now venture to recover himself a little and take under shadow of the darkness a tolerably vigorous step forward he felt somewhat a heavy arm upon his shoulder and fully expected in the next moment to see the long visage of mr gabriel monkton peering at him can i be of any use to you ladies said a voice at his ear which even at that moment of agitation he felt certain was not the voice of the dreaded gabriel you seem a little bewildered i think and if i can be of any service you may command me these very obliging words added by the same voice which though certainly not that of mr gabriel monkton did not appear to the major to be perfectly unknown caused him to turn his head towards the speaker and even to hazard the danger of rendering visible the pearl under his muffler by raising his veil for the purpose of obtaining as good a view as the waning light would permit of the features of this courteous stranger 
on turning his eyes in the direction from whence the voice came he perceived a stout-looking country-wife sort of a body with a shabby old bonnet pulled low over her face a very worn-out shawl a common cotton gown pulled up through the pocket-holes and a pair of fat naked arms with sleeves pushed up considerably above the elbow the woman stepped back as soon as the major's eye fell upon her and addressing patty who followed close behind said you are a very pretty young lady upon my word would you like to have your fortune told miss miss indeed cried the indignant married woman who even in that moment of peril could not permit such a blunder to pass unnoticed what a fool of a woman you must be to fancy i am an unmarried girl we don't want any of your help you may depend upon that so you may get away and let us walk on by ourselves in peace and quiet walk on in peace my pretty dear by all means said the woman but don't be so fond of quiet as to send off good company major allen barnaby notwithstanding the very good reasons he had for wishing to advance beyond the reach of a recall from the steamboat nevertheless lingered on the way for the purpose of hearing the above dialogue and when it had reached this point he suddenly stopped and having looked round him on all sides without perceiving any one pursuing or appearing particularly to notice them he cautiously pronounced the word wife at no great distance from the ear of the female who had thus beset patty it is not every wise child that knows its own mother said the voice of mrs allen barnaby from beneath the humble weeds of the seeming stranger nevertheless a runaway gentleman it seems may know his own wife how could you be so stupid patty however this is no time to stand mumming and making fun continued my heroine for she indeed it was who had thus unceremoniously addressed the party look along the road major she added applying herself to the ear of the tall lady who still rested on the arm of don tornorino look along the road and you will see in what direction the danger lies you and i must not go that way stop one minute all of you and i will tell you what must be done you and i madame feathers and lace must just betake ourselves to the shelter of that particularly dark-looking corner yonder between that barn-looking building and the trees and there i flatter myself we may contrive both to hide ourselves till the steamboat is off again and then by the help of this basket and bundle make ourselves both of us more fit to be seen you tornorino and patty must immediately run back to look after the luggage here is some silver for you to pay one of those porters there that are galloping with their trucks down to the landing-place to look after a job when you have got everything on shore five trunks two portmanteaus three hampers and four carpet-bags remember when you have got it all together take it to the first handsome-looking hotel you come to there look tornorino it must be that house where dark as it is getting you can distinguish so many people before the door take all the things there and as soon as you have heard the bell ring and seen the boat fairly off the major and i will come strolling up as if we had but just that minute stepped on shore and you and patty had better be on the lookout for us even patty seemed at this moment to feel that it was a master spirit who thus rapidly dictated what was to be done and with a greater degree of passive obedience than was at all usual to her she quietly placed herself by her husband's side took hold of his offered arm and without another word being spoken by any of the party they divided and marched off exactly as my ready-witted heroine had commanded the most intimate knowledge of the locality could not have enabled this admirable woman more judiciously to select a spot for arranging the attire of herself and husband than the one which she had thus instinctively chosen no eye no sound no even imagined danger occurred to scare or interrupt them and several minutes before the parting bell of the steamboat was heard they were both of them attired in all respects exactly as they had been when they first stepped on board her the interval of waiting which followed was gratefully employed by the major in expressing to his charming wife a part at least of the admiration and tenderness which her admirable conduct had inspired nothing in fact could be more amiable than the manner in which these sentiments were uttered and received major and mrs allen barnaby were indeed a perfect pattern couple the signal for which they had waited having been at length heard and sufficient time allowed for the little wharf near which they had to pass to have recovered its usual tranquillity the excellently matched pair walked forth from the shelter of the lofty catalpa trees beneath which they had repaired their toilettes and one taking the bag and the other the basket with the careless air with which active-minded travellers do take bags and baskets on quitting steamboats they sauntered arm in arm first to the wharf 
and then from the wharf with the aspect and manner of intelligent and curious strangers desirous of looking about them and seeing everything that was to be seen in this manner they approached the washington's head hotel at the door of which they found the grinning patty and her more sober-minded spouse who both greeted them at the same moment the former by clapping her hands and exclaiming well done mon pa if you ain't two good ones the latter by gently observing that all the things were come and rooms bespeak never had mrs allen barnaby walked up a room with more dignity than she now did that of the table d'hote of the washington's head it was nearly impossible at any time that she could pass unnoticed so peculiarly striking were her person and demeanour but it now was less possible than ever the triumph of success the pride of genius and the consciousness of noble daring brightened her eye and rendered firm her step every eye in the room was fixed upon her the observant major saw this and trembled but the same benignant destiny which had bestowed my heroine upon him as a wife seemed to guard him at this moment from any accident which might render this blessing abortive for not one of the passengers who had accompanied them from buffalo was in the room or even the house of those who had landed by far the greater number had returned on board and of the rest some had gone at once to their homes in the town of cleveland and the rest to some other of the hotels it was not immediately however that even our bold major ventured to look about him sufficiently to ascertain this important and very agreeable fact but at length as his modest glances reached further and further round the room he felt delightedly convinced that so it was anything more genial more domestically sociable more liberally cheering than this supper at the washington's head cleveland can scarcely be imagined the major ordered champagne the ladies declared it first-rate and the don whose happy temperament never required anything for the enjoyment of perfect felicity but the absence of want of all kinds and the presence of all such good things as his taste particularly approved was perfectly touching in his manner of partaking his repast and when he said as the last drop was drained from the second bottle into the glass of his august mother-in-law ah ma one little drop more for my petit it would have required a much harder heart than that of the major to have withstood the hint a third bottle of champagne was accordingly ordered and when it had vanished and not till then my heroine and her fair daughter retreated for the night leaving the major and his son-in-law to talk over the adventures of the last few days chapter forty one more skill required and more skill practised a dinner party as delightful as the supper party which preceded it it can surprise nobody to hear that mrs allen barnaby did not rise very early on the following morning she really had exerted herself greatly through the eventful day which had been passed on board the steamboat and even the very act of taking what she felt to be needful refreshment afterwards contributed to the necessity of lengthened rest on the following morning it was not therefore till past ten o'clock on that morning that my heroine was seen majestically descending the stairs of the hotel adorned with very considerable care and elegance and with an expression of countenance perfectly radiant from the effect of the meditations in which she had indulged during the time she had employed in dressing her position was in truth at this moment such as could not fail to cheer the spirits of any woman possessed of such a mind as hers no philosopher whether ethical moral or military could be more aware of the sinewy species of strength and power given by money than was my heroine and never had she felt so delightful an assurance of having money at her command as at that moment the very stairs as they creaked beneath her tread seemed to do her homage while the glances of a group of men stationed at the street door which stood open immediately in front of her as she descended caused her to remember that considering her size she had a very well-formed foot and thus as is the case of the charming musidora a sense of self-approving beauty stole across her busy thought and completed the happiness of the moment but alas for the short-lived felicity of mortals scarcely had the smile suggested by the thought above alluded to dimpled on her cheek than her eye caught the countenance of her husband which equally to her surprise and displeasure was no longer decked in grateful and affectionate jocosity as she had reasonably hoped to meet it but wore an aspect of uneasiness and gloom that seemed to speak of anything rather than difficulties overcome and a heart at ease what's in the wind now thought she as she made the last step of the descent and swung herself with a graceful sort of impetus round the final banister in order to follow the direction in which her husband's eye and the movement of his head seemed to marshal her 
the moment the major perceived that she understood his signals he walked rapidly on and at the distance of some paces disappeared within a door through which she also passed the minute after and then with equal surprise and alarm saw him shut it and bolt it behind her what on earth is the matter now major allen barnaby said she knitting her brows and looking at least a dozen years older than she had done a few minutes before you surely have not found time enough to get into another scrape you should say my dear that i have not found time enough to get out of an old one how much or how little danger threatens me at this moment i am really unable to say but perhaps when i have told you exactly what i have heard you may be able to give me better advice than i could give myself you know my dear what a confidence i have in your judgment and upon my honour i never wanted a little help more in my life for hang me if i know which way to turn or what to do let me hear the worst at once she replied with some slight movement of impatience i dare say i shall find a way out of the scrape just as easily as you found your way into it heaven grant you may my dear but i shall say you are a witch if you do the case is this i got up this morning while you were still fast asleep and on coming downstairs i found a whole bevy of gentlemen tipplers taking their morning dram at the bar i threw a pretty sharp look amongst them to find out if any of our late fellow passengers were of the set and presently became perfectly certain that there was not one whereupon i drew near among the rest and although as you know well enough i am no great dram drinker i called for a glass like the others that i might see and hear a little what was going on the first words which regaled my ears were these a pretty considerable queer speck old gabriel monkton seems after this go did you hear about it colonel the personage thus addressed was no other than our right worshipful landlord and he replied with all the dignity of his military rank and his distinguished office united hear of it i expect i did gabriel has promised me i don't know how many votes if i will keep a sharp lookout after the females and that i promised and that i'll do provided i can be availed of what they are like and where they are lodged the man himself him what he suspects you know is still snug enough on board he told me but the woman and another man belonging to them was to land last night on account of our glorious leg disagreeing with their english stomachs if it wasn't for gabriel's telling me the man was still aboard and that the man had but one man with them i should be apt to suspect that we had got the very identical set in the house at this moment now wife what do you say to that by way of a pleasant hint and how in the d s name are we to steer clear through such a confounded set of breakers as it is easy to see ahead you have not told me all as yet major said my heroine anxiously you have not told me if any of the party took particular notice of you not the least in the world he replied half a dozen of them began immediately to talk together and having paid my fip for my glass to a young urchin who was acting as deputy to his father at the bar i suffered three or four fresh stragglers to push on before me to listen to the long-winded colonel's history of all that was known or suspected about myself and quietly withdrew from the infernal set without appearing to attract the least attention from any one now then wife that is all and everything i have got to tell you and i shall be very happy in my turn to listen to anything and everything you may wish to say upon it by way of commentary it was at least two minutes before mrs allen barnaby answered this appeal but so eloquently meditative was her countenance that the major notwithstanding the urgent necessity he felt there was for immediate action betrayed no symptom of impatience but waited in perfect silence till his charming oracle spoke this is just about the worst job we've had major she said at length for as sure as you stand there we shall have a regular hue and cry after us throughout the country and as it is not possible to stir an inch without being examined by every man woman and child you meet as if you were before a court of justice it will certainly be no easy matter to keep clear of discovery however it won't do donny to stand still in despair and cry all's over we are neither of us fit for that sort of pitiful work faint heart they say never won fair lady and i am sure faint heart never saved bold gentlemen do you remember my dear the sort of dress and demeanour which your lively fancy induced you to assume when you were first introduced to my relations the huberts at brighton oh yes perfectly said the major briskly i thought it advisable to be in the saint line then in order to assimilate myself to the character of the former mr o'donagough exactly so my dear said his wife 
but though you remember this i am sure you do not remember for it was impossible you could judge of it the inconceivable alteration which this dress and manner made in your appearance it is impossible any disguise could be more complete what i should propose therefore is that you resume this for the time we remain in the country for let rumours be circulated about you either from new orleans big gang bank philadelphia new york or this nasty hateful lake erie this disguise would completely baffle them all for in neither of those places my dear did you think proper to appear at all in the likeness of a saint and besides you know there is not a country in the whole world where it would be likely to answer better in every respect for while we were at the springs i heard a dozen different histories at the very least all showing the extraordinary respect and veneration in which the travelling evangelical preachers are held they told me that if a new dancing-girl and a new preacher appeared in a town at the same time it was always a very close-run contest between them and generally ended by all the gentlemen following the dancer and all the ladies the preacher now this would do for you exactly donny because none of your little tricks have been played off upon the ladies and therefore none of them go where we may will be likely to find you out but surely my dear you don't expect me actually to set up for a preacher cried the major looking a good deal alarmed and pray why not major allen barnaby replied his high-spirited wife what in the world should prevent you then not having your universal and commanding genius mrs allen barnaby he rejoined adding very gravely i have not the slightest objection to shave close moustache favori and all if you advise it and i shall not wonder if in fact it were to prove the very best thing i could possibly do but as to mounting a pulpit i must confess i do not feel a call for it i am convinced that i should stand staring at the congregation like a fool without being able to say a word nonsense major when did you ever find it difficult to palaver you are the very man for it we will just contrive if we can that you shall hear some high-flying preacher once and when you see how it is done you will find it easy enough to set off in the same style i'll be bound for you well then set about it my barnaby you are a wonder of a woman and i believe you could make me do anything in the world that you took it into your head to command just say when i must shave and where i must go and what i must preach and you shall find me a perfect pattern of obedience you are a perfect pattern of wisdom donny i will say that for you a wise man when he is sinking always holds fast i take it to what he thinks is most likely to float in that you do this my good major i believe nobody will deny and for that very reason my dear you will always find me ready and willing to hold out a helping hand to save you upon my soul i have found it so and i should more than once have been puzzled to know what to do without you there is no denying it now then i presume you mean to be off from this place directly there's a boat goes by to sandusky at eleven this morning and another at nine in the evening but of course the first will suit us best do you really think so major said my heroine looking in his face with an eye that laughed very saucily if you do i must confess that i do think you want a little of my assistance what do you mean said the major slightly frowning but at the same time firmly resolved to preserve his good humour let his lady say what she would what can you mean by saying that i mean major allen barnaby replied his wife with mock solemnity that if it be your will and pleasure to decide upon this mode of proceeding the chances are about a thousand to one in favour of our being followed to sandusky as suspicious characters i have no doubt of it mrs allen barnaby replied the persecuted gentleman rather tartly my own opinion is that the chances are about two thousand to half a one in favour of the agreeable catastrophe to which you allude then why risk it my love said his wife hanging her head sentimentally and speaking with great tenderness of accent and how to avoid it he returned precisely with the same attitude and tone wait one instant and i will tell you said his wife placing her finger on her forehead and closing her eyes to give her thoughts uninterrupted range within having remained thus alone as it were for half a moment she said in this way you must avoid it let us both immediately return to our room you mounting the stairs first and i behind you no particular notice has been directed your way as yet all was bustle and confusion when we came in last night the waiters had just time enough to bring us all we called for and as it seemed no more 
for if you remember there was not one of them that remained in the room a moment after the wine or whatever it was had been set down this morning by your account there was no more leisure for curious examination than there was last night so that i flatter myself you and your whiskers are not as yet much known by sight among them having reached our room donny we will lock the door and then i will shear you as close as a may-day lamb in which operation your razor shall assist my scissors and then major allen barnaby i will open the smallest of the three great trunks and prove to you that if i do upon some occasions expend a great deal in dress with a view to the honour and respectability of my family there are others when the most thoughtful economy in this respect is the rule of my actions do you remember my dear the black and grey suit in which you dined at the house of my nephew general hubert at brighton yes perfectly replied the major smiling but it is considerably more than a year ago that i last saw it and it is quite beyond hope that you should have it here mrs allen barnaby laid her hand upon the bolt of the door to withdraw it saying come upstairs with me major and you shall see but cough a little as you pass the bar and hold your handkerchief to your face we must not just for the present display your magnificent mustachios thus instructed and displaying in all ways the most exemplary obedience the major left the little room in which the above conversation had passed mounted the stairs and closely followed by his lady entered the apartment in which they had passed the night and in which tornorino had seen their voluminous luggage carefully lodged having reached this sanctuary and cautiously secured its door not a moment was lost by either in performing the business they had in hand and while she drew forth a complete suit of very evangelical-looking attire complete even to the white cravat and grey and black shot silk waistcoat he set to work upon his forest-like face and hewed and mowed away till he was as well shaven and shorn as any reasonable christian could desire in the finishing this rather laborious work she not only found time to assist him but as she did so so enlightened him as to what was next to be done as follows now then donny with that dress yonder carefully put on and your low-crowned hat upon this nice grey head i will defy all the gabriel monktons in yankeeland to identify you so far so good but now listen to the rest i suspect by the way i have seen the servant girls coming and going that there is a back stairs at the end of the long passage just outside our door while you are dressing i'll just have a peep as to that matter if i am right we know of course that it will open to the back of the house because the passage runs straight through it as soon as you get downstairs don't look in a bustle but move quietly on like a patient saint as you are to find your way out of the back door this done you may easily of course regain the street and then make for the franklin hotel which you heard them say at the wharf was on the other side of the landing-place when you get there order breakfast for yourself and dinner for some friends who are amusing themselves by looking about and tell them that your party are going on to sandusky by the nine o'clock boat meanwhile we will breakfast here and announce that we are going off by the eleven o'clock boat and just as it comes in sight i will have all the luggage taken down to the wharf i will pay the bill and tell the people that i expect you will meet us on board but that if you happen to come in after we have left the house they must send you after us in all haste all this being provided for the rest follows without difficulty when we get down to the wharf at eleven o'clock we shall of course have the dreadful disappointment of finding no major allen barnaby there whereupon i shall order the porter to set down the baggage and leave it and if he or any of the clamorous waiters invite us to turn back again i shall pay them handsomely but decline the invitation stating as my reason that i prefer being near the landing-place and then the franklin hotel porters will of course offer their services and ere midday my dear i shall i doubt not be safely reunited not to major allen barnaby but to the reverend mr o'donagough excellent perfect and worthy of yourself exclaimed the major but the leather labels bearing our names at full length on the boxes they will be all lost my dear before we get to the franklin hotel no single circumstance of this admirably arranged plan went wrong mrs allen barnaby had exactly time enough for all she had to do before the eleven o'clock boat was announced tornorino and patty were made to be perfectly au fait of the scheme 
the bill though a high one was paid without a murmur and the only recollection of the party that remained at the washington hotel was that they were a set of english spendthrifts who drank champagne unaccountable but made no bones about paying for it End of chapters forty and forty one chapter forty two of the barnabys in america by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter forty two another pleasant family repast the major practises his part before his wife and child they are enchanted the happy family concert measures for the future the major performs his part before company with the most brilliant success there certainly are some people who either from fortune or temper or the influence of both united seem to swim down the stream of life more gaily than others such persons it is true will often keep their colours flying long after fainter spirits would strike which may often perhaps give them the appearance of being more triumphant than they really are but if this be sometimes delusive at any rate it has often the effect of imposing upon the parties themselves and may perhaps not unfrequently produce that mad sort of luxury which as the poet tells us none but madmen know considering the nature of the adventures through which the barnaby race has passed since their arrival in the united states of america and the species of catastrophe with which nearly every adventure had concluded they could scarcely have enjoyed themselves so vehemently as they certainly did at the franklin hotel upon lake erie had not their spirits been excited by some portion of the sort of laughing gas above alluded to the supper at the washington had been delightfully full of fun frolic triumphant glee and the dinner at the franklin was if possible more brilliant still nobody unless it had been asmodeus himself could have looked upon the group there assembled and have doubted their being in the possession of some especial cause for rejoicing and merriment the harmony that reigned among them seemed as perfect as the contentment and in short a merrier party could not easily have been found patty indeed was a little in the dark as to the nature of the scrape from which her pap had just escaped but this only added to the jocularity of the rest as she never alluded to the cleverness of her mamma in managing so beautifully to prevent her papa's being hanged without eliciting a most cordial burst of laughter from the major and his lady and a charming simper of answering applause from her don but time wore away and as the hours rolled on towards nine o'clock major allen barnaby hinted with an amiable apology to the family group for marring their mirth by drawing their attention to business that it would be necessary or at least prudent to decide upon where they were to go and what they were to do next before going on board as he said this very gravely the effect of it was rather to increase than mar their mirth for patty laughed immoderately and declared that when pap put on a preaching face in addition to his preaching garments the fun was just perfect whereupon the major in order to prove his unabated good humour and the reality of his reluctance to substitute business for fun stood up and placing the back of his chair before him to represent the front of a pulpit he began amidst shouts of applause from patty and her mamma to show them how he intended to preach after devoting a few minutes however to this capital joke he resumed his seat and renewed his request that the subject of their next campaign might be taken into consideration where for instance he asked where are you to be all of you while i am performing the part of a travelling minister at sandusky where repeated patty where should we be my darling papa but close to you and hearing you preach to be sure this would be the pleasantest scheme for me my dear patty there can be no doubt of that replied the major but i question whether it would be the safest because of the danger of my laughing pa is that what you mean if it is you are just a goose for your pains said his daughter for as i told you before you shan't come to be hanged if i can help it and i'll be bound for it that if you give us a fair trial mamma will be quite as likely to start off laughing when you begin to preach as i should thank you my dear patty for caring so much about my safety replied her father politely kissing her hand but i am afraid patty that it is not your laughing or your mother's either that will constitute the danger of our being together i fancy not indeed cried mrs allen barnaby eagerly what can you be thinking of child to talk such nonsense a pretty way it will be for him to remain unknown to have you and i and tornorino following him about alas rejoined the major tenderly no man wishing to escape observation must travel with such handsome faces and that's true mr pap i don't deny it said the young beauty with a well-pleased smile 
but what will you do with us then must we set off without you as we did when we went to the springs exactly so madame tornorino said mrs allen barnaby with decision indeed i'm afraid that so it must be quoth the major but it will only be necessary to make the separation long enough to ensure my being pretty generally known by sight at sandusky as the rev mr o'donagough this will you know effectually prevent my being traced thither as major allen barnaby and it is to this device that i must trust for my security during my future wanderings through this comical country having thus thrown out my amiable friend mr gabriel monkton i shall have no doubts or fears whatever about rejoining you and the only question is as to where this reunion so greatly wished for by me shall take place the first thing to consider in settling that point said mrs allen barnaby is how we can with the least danger of meeting any one whom we desire to avoid draw gradually nearer and nearer to the coast for i confess that notwithstanding all the wonderful success we have met with i shall be most excessively rejoiced to feel myself once more on the highway towards europe i don't care a straw about going back to england but i certainly do long to be in europe once more and in europe once more my dear you most certainly shall be before you are a year older provided that is to say that you do not get tired of my company and elope in the interval with some such fascinating individuals as mr gabriel monkton mr john williams mr colonel beauchamp or mr judge johnson as for myself i honestly avow that i have had quite enough of well and what may you be called and where do you calculate you are going and what location did you fix in last i won't deny that i am tired to death of it all but i have no great fancy for england either just at present at least and so if we are all agreed i expect as the darlings say that our pleasantest plan will be to make for havre de grace and from thence to paris afterwards perhaps we may vary the scene again by visiting baden baden you know tornorino there are a thousand pleasant places we may go to provided we can get off from these confounded states without having our wings clipped and that i will engage for your doing without let or hindrance said his wife if you don't get tired of preaching too soon donny i got a good deal of information about the western country at the springs and that it was i believe which first put the notion of your turning preacher into my head miss wiggily that was the name of my principal friend at the springs miss wiggily told me that it was quite past belief how a tolerably good-looking man would be followed in any one of the western towns if he did but make noise enough now i don't think anybody can deny major that you are rather more than tolerably well-looking still though i won't say you are quite as handsome as when i first saw you at clifton and as for making a noise as she calls it if you have but the will i am sure you will find the way a thousand thanks for all your charming compliments my dear replied the major trust me it shall not be from want of exertion that i will fail but what else did you learn from your friend miss wiggily i think it will be quite as well not to make any particular inquiries here about the country beyond sandusky there is no occasion whatever that we should leave a plan of our route behind us did the lady mention any considerable towns westward oh mercy yes returned his wife more than i can remember a great deal but i have a sort of general idea about the way we have got to go and of the principal towns we must pass in order to get round again to the sea for that you know is what we must do before we can set off according to the major's beautiful new plan most certainly my dear he replied we must get round again as you call it to the sea but there is more than that to be thought of we have got to make up our minds as to which port will be most agreeable to us i don't think i should particularly like either new york philadelphia or new orleans however there are many others to choose from but we need not trouble ourselves about that now let us get fairly off to the wild west as some of them call it and we can settle about the port to sail from afterwards to be sure we can answered his wife and you may be sure of something else too and that is if you will go on dressed as you are now and let us call ourselves o'donagough we may go safe and sound anywhere no living soul would ever find us out particularly if we take care not to stay too long my gracious how you talk mamma cried patty staring at her do you fancy that because pap happened to fight a duel at new york like an honourable brave gentleman as he is that we are all to be hunted through the country as if we were wild beasts with a pack of dogs at our heels 
the rest of the party exchanged looks upon hearing this very sensible question and it seemed for a moment as if nobody chose to answer it but at length major allen barnaby replied nothing can be more natural than your observation my dear patty but the fact is that the government of the united states is very remarkable upon this point the horror in which they hold duelling is so great that all the states have agreed together to punish with sudden and prompt vengeance any individual who has been guilty of it let him have committed it where he may however i rest with entire confidence on the opinion of your mother as to the safety insured by the change of name and appearance and i really think that once out of this part of the country we may make our way to the coast by whatever course may eventually appear the most agreeable to us well then that's all settled cried my heroine gaily and there is only one more question to be asked before we make ourselves ready for starting where are we to perch ourselves while the reverend major establishes his reputation as a preacher at sandusky upon my word my dear it is a question that i think you must answer yourself for thanks to your miss wiggly it seems evident that you know more about that part of the country than i do replied the major well then she replied with decision i vote for our pushing on to pittsburgh at once because i know that is one of the places at which we may conveniently decide whether we will go to new orleans or not it would be certainly by far the most convenient for miss wiggly told me it was all by water and monstrous cheap and the other way we should have to cross over some tiresome high mountains which would cost double as much good that then will be the place and the time for deciding our port of embarkation yes pittsburgh shall be your quarters till i rejoin you said the major which will be i should hope in about ten days or a fortnight this ended the discussion and till the steamboat was announced the party amused themselves by imagining the vexation of mr gabriel monkton on arriving at sandusky and finding the bird he was in pursuit of flown had any doubts rested on the minds of major and mrs allen barnaby as to the advantages likely to arise from the reassumption of the respectable attire which had been first adopted at brighton the very first specimen of their reception on board the boat would have removed them though the day had been bright and warm the evening air on the lake was already cold and chilling and my heroine and her daughter almost immediately descended to the lady's cabin in search of warmth and shelter even before they moved from the gallery however the warmth-loving tornarino had escaped to the smoky sanctuary of the gentleman's saloon so that when the ladies moved major allen barnaby or rather mr o'donagough would have been left alone had he not moved with them he therefore did so watching with his usual attention the steps of his charming patty whose peculiar style of galloping movement on all occasions made the operation of descending cabin stairs somewhat dangerous ere she reached the door at the bottom however which as it was open displayed a considerable number of females within she suddenly stopped exclaiming oh goodness papa get upstairs again as fast as you possibly can do you know we were told at the springs that it was not at all safe for a gentleman to go into the ladies cabin after it was the least bit dark for that if they did they were very often soused over head and ears with water and sometimes made wet to their skin before they could get away this advice being given without any mitigation of the speaker's usually well-sustained voice it reached the ears of two ladies who at that moment occupied the doorway and the light of the ample lamp above it darting its rays at the same moment full upon the comely shaven face cropped grey hair and sable suit of the major they were both instantly seized with a fit of compunction at the idea that so reverend-looking a gentleman should suppose it possible that among american females he should run any risk of being subjected to the discipline sometimes resorted to in order to keep persons of a far different stamp in order full of praiseworthy feeling the eldest of the two ladies exclaimed oh my pray miss don't say that to the gentleman as if what you describe was intended for such as him it would be twenty times more likely sir she added making the respectable-looking gentleman a low curtsey ay sir fifty times more likely i expect that every female present should quit and be off to the deck to make place to a gentleman of your appearance than do by you what the young lady mentions but i calculate she is a stranger in these parts nothing could be better timed than this amiable and conciliating address for it not only gave cheering evidence of the perfect success of mrs allen barnaby's happily imagined project but most fortunately reminded the principal actor in it of his cue which to say truth he had utterly forgotten and had not the warning voice reached him at that identical moment he would have replied to his daughter's speech in a manner which might have very nearly neutralized the effect of his appearance as it was however all went well 
the major was far from being a slow man and too much depended upon his own adroitness on the present occasion for him not to rally his powers in an instant so as to perform the part his admirable wife had allotted him in a manner to do him as well as herself infinite honour great indeed would have been the shock to her nerves if he had not done so for she was on the stair behind him and her noble bosom heaved with anxiety as she awaited his reply to the words above recorded but she had no cause to fear his words were appropriate but his manner was better still may you meet the reward you deserve dear lady for feelings which do you so much honour he said i will not abuse this most exemplary feeling but if it be shared as i trust it is by the amiable-looking group i see behind you i will enter amongst you with pleasure for a short interval hoping that my presence may do more good than harm the meekness of this reply was exceedingly touching from the modesty the humility and gentleness of its tone and it instantly received the reward it deserved for no less than six females more all of them young and for the most part well-looking pressed forward to second the invitation of the first speaker the only one indeed who was neither the one nor the other was the only one also who did not appear to share the general enthusiasm she kept herself very decidedly apart from the group that now pressed round the rev mr o'donagough very much after the manner of bees round honey nor did she open her lips at all till the stewardess came in to complete her arrangements for the night and to her she certainly took the liberty of addressing a few observations but not in a tone sufficiently loud to prevent the eager conversation still going on among the rest of the party from continuing as uninterruptedly as if she had not spoken at all i guess said one pretty young lady about seventeen years of age that so kind and pious a gentleman as you seem to be sir won't take it amiss if one of the sisters of the needle steeple congregation of sandusky takes the liberty of asking your name instead of a liberty my dearest young lady i can only look upon it as a beautiful proof of a lovely christian spirit seeking fellowship and brotherhood with the godly replied the reverend mr o'donagough indeed sir responded the fair sister i calculated that you would just say that or else i am sure i wouldn't have spoken for the world thanks to my pastors and masters i know my duty better than to put in my oar out of place and what is your name then sir our major was at this moment in imminent danger of exchanging a glance with his wife so greatly amused was he at perceiving that notwithstanding the decided evangelical tendency of his fair fellow-passenger the national catechism still evidently superseded all others in her thoughts but luckily he remembered what he was about and in such good time too that the profane smile was perfectly well converted into everything he wished to make it and he replied in the very best manner possible my name my dear young lady is o'donagough i am called the reverend mr o'donagough oh my exclaimed the charming young creature in return i didn't for a single moment doubt your being the reverend that would have been a sin indeed that i should have had to confess at the next meeting of the sisters in course sir you have heard tell of the needle steeple congregation of sandusky i believe our congregation is pretty well known by this time in most parts of the world it would be an ignorance of which i might justly be ashamed my dear young lady had i not heard of it but i rejoice to say that it is long since i first became acquainted with the admirable society to which you allude not personally indeed that is a happiness to which i am still looking forward with all the eagerness of hope but it is long since the needle steeple congregation of sandusky has been known to me by the voice of fame my isn't it a pleasure and a reward mrs tompkins to hear ourselves spoken of in this way by such a pious gentleman from over the sea too as tis plain enough he is by his way said the young lady clasping her hands thankfully i am sure miss vanderpuff i feel it to be so from the very top of my head to the soles of my feet and i am thankful for the privilege of conversing with the like it may not be that impossible sir continued mrs tompkins addressing the major with a most engaging look of affectionate humility indeed i can't say that i see it should be at all improbable but what you cross the water just on purpose to have a look at us our revivals are talked of far and near that we all know for a certainty and our camp meetings have been taken as a pattern and example for miles and miles my dear ladies replied the rev mr o'donagough pressing both his hands firmly upon his heart and raising his eyes with great fervour to the ceiling of the cabin my dear ladies it is difficult for me to express my feelings at this moment 
this lucky chance this happy thrice happy accident inspires me with a degree of joy and thankfulness that i have no language adequately to express your conjecture is perfectly correct my excellent mrs tomkins i did indeed leave my native land for the express purpose of becoming personally acquainted with the needle steeple congregation of sandusky in the delightful hope that by the most indefatigable attention on my part to its principles and all the precious regulations respecting it i might be enabled to carry home with me to my own dear but comparatively benighted country such hints of holiness and morsels of mercy as might enable me to purify and enlighten my own beloved congregation so as to make them become to great britain what the needle steeple congregation of sandusky has become to the united states of america think then dear ladies he continued think what must be my feelings at finding myself thus in the very midst of those for whose sake i have toiled and tossed across the wide atlantic it is indeed a most providential blessing sir said a third lady coming forward and placing herself with her hands crossed behind her immediately opposite to him i am mrs general pedmington of mount lebanon and these two sisters of the congregation will be able i expect to give you very satisfactory reasons for thinking that if you indeed seek to make yourself acquainted with the needle steeple and its dependencies you were pretty tolerably in the right path when you happened to fall in with me oh my i expect that you are indeed exclaimed miss vanderpuff isn't he mrs tomkins indeed sir and that's what you are returned the lady thus appealed to mrs general pedmington is the very tip-top of the congregation in all respects and has sat in the front row of the anxious benches for these two years past and it is she sir who gives up at mount lebanon and a right down beautiful place it is too the very largest and holiest of parties throughout the revivals it is a privilege just to be present at one of them i am sure no person of good judgment would ever wish to make one in a worldly-minded party afterwards a privilege indeed returned the major with a deep-drawn sigh i know of none in any country that i should value so highly then in course sir you ought to be one of us and such i hope you will be mr o'donagough that sir i think is your name mr o'donagough bowed and looked deeply grateful well then sir when we reach our place of destination i hope we shall become better acquainted my residence as these ladies have told you is mount lebanon and when you have fixed yourself at your boarding-house or hotel as the case may be you shall be pleased to send me up your address and i will take care that one or two of our ministers shall wait upon you and then we will fix an evening for meeting the sisters and a few clerical individuals at my house this open and decided patronage on the part of mrs general pedmington induced the other professing ladies of the company to take courage and come forward from behind the bed curtains where they had concealed themselves on the entrance of the reverend gentleman and one or two among them even ventured to put into his hand some little tracts without which as we all know such ladies never travel so that in the course of a few minutes the major found himself the centre of a circle which effectually hemmed him in and rendered his withdrawing himself from the forbidden precincts where this scene took place a matter of very great difficulty while all this interesting conversation was going on in one part of the little cabin mrs allen barnaby and her fair daughter took refuge in another and that at the farthest possible extremity from the scene of action my heroine's motive for thus withdrawing herself was one which at every period of her life and under all variety of circumstances had ever maintained too strong and active a hold upon her mind to be ever entirely laid aside or forgotten personal comfort and the best accommodation for the coming night which the actual state of things permitted occupied her completely during the interval which the major was employing with so much energy in propitiating the favour of his new friends but the circumstances in which madame tornorino found herself were totally different from those of either of her parents at this time she had but one sole object in view which was to conceal the irresistible fit of laughter which seized upon her on hearing her father make the various speeches recorded above under any other circumstances whatever the unscrupulous patty would have laughed out without caring a single farthing whether pa and ma were angry or pleased but the notion which she had got into her head that her father was in very considerable danger of being hanged and certainly would be if discovered to be major allen barnaby instead of the reverend mr o'donagough really terrified her greatly and she never in her life had exerted herself so strenuously to overcome any feeling as she did now to check her ill-timed mirth but it was all in vain 
totally unused to restraint of any kind she was quite unable to control her rebellious muscles and after a long and violent struggle finally broke out into one of the most vociferous paroxysms of laughter that was ever heard just as her father urged by his success up to the very enthusiasm of perfect acting stretched out his hands right and left to receive the offered tracts with a smile which many besides patty might have found it difficult to withstand the effect of this sudden explosion was startling and might have been fatal but for the admirable presence of mind of the major no instant was lost by him in doubting what the sound might be or what the cause of it nor did it take him longer to decide how this alarming contretemps should be met the effect of this tremendous burst of merriment was not more startling to himself than to those who stood around each meekly meditating how best to display before the eyes of so holy a gentleman their own particular and individual holiness as the unexpected sound burst upon their ears they one and all stood with staring eyes raised hands and open mouths as if they had each been touched by an enchanter's hand and were rapidly passing from flesh and blood to stone oh my what's that cried miss vanderpuff actually trembling from head to foot oh dear oh dear groaned miss tompkins it is right down awful to hear it for as sure as the sun is in heaven it is neither more nor less than somebody just laughing at us and if it is mrs tompkins observed the stately mrs general pedmington with a withering frown what is that to us are we still so unworthy of our election as to tremble before the idiot roar of a scoffer but ma'am tis the very lady he brought down screamed another sister whose eye following the direction of the sound caught sight of the unlucky patty's showy dress peeping from behind the curtain of one of the little beds in which she had endeavoured to hide herself possible cried another looking at the major with an altered eye and appearing to shudder as if seized with an ague fit possible screamed a third possible echoed a fourth alas poor major how stood he the while in reply to this but too intelligible demand as to the possibility of his being in any way connected with this irreverent laughter he looked around him with an eye expressive of such profound melancholy that ere he had spoken a single word in his own defence his cause was already half gained but he did not do his tongue such injustice as to trust only to his eye although that expressive organ was again called upon to aid him ere he spoke for drawing a white handkerchief from his pocket he pressed it to the upper part of his face and by a slightly convulsive movement about the shoulders might be supposed for several minutes to be weeping bitterly no men in the world weep so much as the itinerant preachers of america and this yielding to the weakness in their military disciple was a fine trait of acute observation having recovered himself however from this first paroxysm of emotion he said pity me my friends pity the misery of an unhappy father whose only child has made herself the wife of a catholic and then poisoned the dreadful shaft thus hurled at the very tenderest point of his heart by giving way to ribald merriment such as you have just listened to whenever she hears the voice of evangelical holiness from any one oh what are the tortures of that inquisition which her new faith teaches her to venerate compared to what she now inflicts upon me it is perfectly impossible to conceive a more touching scene than that which followed this confidential avowal the five sisters of the needle steeple congregation with the distinguished mrs general pedmington at their head vied with each other in demonstrating the tender commiseration to which this disclosure had given birth sighs groans broken sentences and copious tears all bore witness to their amiable feelings and your lady sir said mrs general pedmington making a gulping effort to overcome her emotion and speak distinctly your lady how does she conduct herself in this trying case alas madam alas i have no comfort there was the melancholy reply she is within hearing ma'am though she has crept into yonder bed and affects to be sleeping but however much i may suffer for it afterwards i will not shrink from avowing to such ears as yours the terrible fate that has fallen upon me alas i am a lonely and most desolate man having a wife yet no wife having a daughter and yet being worse than childless dear excellent ladies i have now opened my whole heart to you and the comfort of it is great for i know you will pity me peculiarly affectionate and endearing as are the manners and feelings of such ladies as the sisters of the needle steeple congregation to all persons belonging to their sect 
it is a fact exceedingly obvious to an accurate observer that no instances of worldly misfortune elicit so much ardent compassion and sympathy among them as matrimonial differences of opinion this peculiar species of charity was particularly evident on the present occasion though each of the pitying ladies as she threw a heart-broken sort of glance on the unfortunate gentleman felt determined to check all verbal expression of her feelings for the present in consequence of the close proximity of his uncongenial wife this feeling indeed was so general among them that the only words uttered audibly were from the lips of mrs general pedmington and merely consisted of this cautious phrase at a future opportunity sir i trust we may meet again at this moment the stewardess entered and the solitary lady passenger who as related above had not joined in making the major free of the cabin addressed her with some asperity saying if you knew your business mistress i expect i should not be kept out of my berth when i want to get into it by having the lady's cabin turned into a chapel if you won't turn that male passenger out i must go and find the captain that's all it will readily be believed that the intrusion of major allen barnaby into the lady's cabin did not continue long after this hint he just paused to give one circular glance of grateful acknowledgment to the fair friends he left there and then sprang up the narrow stairs with the activity of fifteen when the passengers were disembarking on the following morning the major took care to be on the gangway for the purpose of offering his hand to the ladies of the needle steeple congregation as they stepped across the plank a civility which was graciously received by them all and in the case of mrs general pedmington rewarded by a whispered renewal of the invitation to mount lebanon End of chapter forty two